the global printing industry, now it is becoming digital, highly, highly digital. It has a very rich history. And how big the industry is? $840 billion. If you are taking my classes, we talk about industry analysis all the time. So the industry is very big. It's in every country. This is an international marketing class, also related to international business, international management. And you go to any country, you need printing. And for printing, you need labels, you need letters, everything. So this is where we invited uh, Mr. Freeman to talk about this industry. As I said, it has a very rich history. It goes back to 1400. And we discussed in our classes the Silk Road and all the activities in the last many years. Uh, it created uh, information, it spread information, it brought knowledge, it brought books, it brought everything. So this uh, basically was a very big revolution in the world. So this is why we are going to discuss. But uh, then came the digital in the last especially 15 years. And if you look at some of the digital presses, those are big. I mean, if you go to some of the cities, and the industry itself is very big. Some of the big players, Topan from Tokyo, Dai Nippon, Tokyo, RR, Denali, Chicago, and of course, uh, we have Bertelsmann, Germany. And then there are other companies. But uh, the industry itself is very dynamic, always on the move, and it's uh, changing very fast. Uh, before uh, I say a few things, let me uh, introduce uh, Mr. Tony Freeman. He has a distinguished career, over 50 years. But in 1973, he became a partner in Amarello with Trafton Printing. And uh, Trafton was acquired by Senvio, which is a billion-plus-dollar company. It has 7,000-plus employees. And uh, it's 989 number on the global Fortune 500. And uh, it has a very distinguished history. Mr. Freeman attended Tascosa High School. Some of you have attended Tascosa High School. Then he received his BBA, MBA from our university. And that's why we are so proud. And above all, in the last many years, I don't know if you still do that or no, but in the last many years, he taught at AC, Amarillo College. It is our uh, very good uh, pipeline to WT. Uh, they are also doing a very good job in Amarillo. Some of you went to Amarillo. And then uh, Mr. Freeman also had a BBA, MBA, of course. Uh, uh, he taught courses like marketing, advertising, communication, all the courses. And a uh, long time ago, we used to teach in evening, and this is where we used to meet. But overall, <coughs> he has a very distinguished career. He's also very active in uh, Amarillo. All organizations, he's actively involved, he and his wife. And overall, uh, they are productive member of our society, our area. And we are very proud to have Mr. Freeman. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's give a warm welcome to our friend, Mr. Freeman. Thank you, Dr. Anwar. Appreciate it very much. You know, it's interesting when I listen to an introduction like that, the older you get, the more it starts sounding like an obituary than it does an introduction. But anyway, thank you, Dr. Anwar. Dr. Anwar has always been one of my favorite, favorite people. Uh, Enjoyed getting to know him when we uh, taught nights together down here back in the 80s, 90s. Wonderful man, done a lot for, uh, for, uh, for West Texas A&M. Uh, what I would like to do just for a minute or two is talk a little bit just about my career since I left what was then West Texas State University. Uh, my father had been in the uh, property casualty insurance business, and I kind of thought I would probably go in business with my dad once I graduated. But I had this real bent, this real desire to be involved in the advertising industry. So when I graduated, I was kind of at a crossroads as to really what to do. And so if you know who Yogi Berra is, the great philosopher and catcher for the New York Yankees, made a comment one time, when you come to a fork in the road, you take it. 
And so there I was, and I decided that I would pursue a career in the advertising uh, industry. So I uh, interviewed with a large advertising agency in Amarillo, had two interviews, as a matter of fact, and on the second interview, Mr. Curphy with McCormick Advertising said, you know, you're almost what I'm looking for. The problem is you just don't have any real world advertising experience. But here's what I'd recommend you do. Why don't you go to work for a radio station, a TV station, a print shop, a newspaper, outdoor advertising industry, something like that, and uh, get some real world experience and then come back in about three or four years and we'll have this conversation again. So I did, so I went to work for a company later known as Trafton Autry Printing. Had about 10 employees, uh, uh, relatively profitable, uh, struggle to some degree. So I set out making cold calls, but most of the calls that I had most success with, I was calling on advertising agencies and uh, uh, corporate communications departments for like uh, Southwest Public Service, a gas company, and then I started calling, co-calling in Lubbock, Midland, Odessa, Eastern New Mexico, and over time developed a pretty good book of business that was primarily advertising related. Uh, bought into the business, as Dr. Anwar said, and uh, things were really going great for eight or 10 years. And then my partner, uh, Ronald Trafton, dropped dead of a massive heart attack on his 50th birthday, and nobody dies on your birthday, but he was 50 years old and dropped dead July 13th, 1983, which was quite a blow to me. Uh, within about a year, year and a half, we had a massive fire in our press room. So I went through a four or five year period that uh, really pretty difficult. And the lessons I learned in the MBA program here at West Texas, then West Texas State University, really helped me understand SBA loans, how to manage employees, uh, how to grow our business without growing too fast. And so I, I would say that the time that I spent here in the MBA program was very instrumental uh, in my future. We also, about that same time, the digital world was coming on and we made the leap in our pre-press and design area from uh, analog to digital which was also a lot of added expense. And so we grew our company uh, until 1998. We were running uh, six days a week, 24 hours a day, uh, producing about 11 million a year in sales with a double digit net profit. And uh, we were approached by a public company out of uh, Stanford, Connecticut to sell our business. And this was kind of in the days of merger and acquisition and so we couldn't think of a of a reason not to do that. And so we, we sold our business. Now, if you've had an entrepreneurship class, one thing that you probably, probably have heard them say is that a lot of entrepreneurs that grow their business and someday hope to sell it to a public company, you're probably gonna go through some, some mental hardships because most people that owned and operated a business don't take orders very well from people in corporate America. And I will tell you, for the first year or two, that was kind of my situation because nobody ever did things the way I would have done it. Well, after a couple of years, I very quickly learned that our company then, Cinveo, was worldwide. We had uh, 50 uh, locations in uh, the States. We had the UK. We had uh, four locations in India and, uh, and representation in the Far East. So I learned very quickly that the uh, technological resources in our other companies were far more than what we had in Amarillo. So we could uh, do load sharing, which I'll talk more about, about later, and also uh, best practices. You learn a lot from people that have been in the industry as long or longer than you have that are operating larger, larger companies. So I learned a lot there. And uh, the other side that was a real benefit was that we shared companies that we printed for. So I got the experience over the years to print for companies like Intuit, Viking River Cruise, Princess Cruises, uh, uh, Carfax, uh, Carvana, Hyatt Hotels, uh, a lot of national companies that we would not probably have had the opportunity to work for 
uh, had we not sold the business. So I was going to stay five years. Five became 10, 10 became 20, and I retired uh, into the year last year. And so uh, it was a good business. I've only had one job, still have a key to the front door that I got in 1970. So uh, that's pretty much it for me. Uh, you all heard the saying, if it's in print, then it's got to be true, right? Well, just for a minute, I've got three little things. I think they're a little bit humorous that you might enjoy. First one says, now is your chance to get your ears pierced and take an extra pair home. They probably meant an extra pair of earrings. Uh, this one was also in print. I saw this actually in the uh, classifieds. Now is your, no, let's see. Why go anywhere else and be cheated? Come here first. Probably didn't think that one through very well. And then this one probably is a very true statement. Federal agents raid gun shop, find weapons. Wow, good job. Uh, so what I wanna do for the next few minutes moving forward, I wanna talk about uh, the printed word from a historical perspective. Uh, and I'm gonna do this by covering very quickly uh, these sections of, uh, of uh, history. First, ancient beginnings. Well, no one knows exactly when humans began to communicate because there was no such thing as a written word, right? There's no way to preserve, to preserve thoughts and ideas. But fast forward, a picture's worth a thousand words, right? So this was a cave drawing. I think you can follow along here. We know exactly what's happening. We've got three hunters following, uh, trying to take in the winter meat supply. Made down the lower left-hand corner, we might have the, some cheerleaders or maybe their wife and kids. Uh, and then over at the far right, we've got probably a couple of senior citizens maybe having an adult beverage and they're having a, uh, having a cookout. So, you know, things may not have changed a whole lot from the early days of the cave drawings, but... Again, no written word, but we uh, kind of knew what was going on in society because of cave, uh, cave drillings, writings. Well, now fast forward to uh, ancient civilization about 4,000 BC. Uh, in 1920, archeologists found, only 100 years ago did they find this, the very first forms of the written word, and it was called cuneiform. Now, they found that in Old Mesopotamia, which is about where present day, present day Iraq is. So it's no wonder that civilization really started when they first discovered the written word. Fast forward about a thousand years to Egypt. Now the Egypt, Egyptians had their own form of writing. It's called hieroglyphics. And they were the first ones that actually wrote on paper uh, a papyrus product that actually they grew along the Nile River. Now fast forward again to the Roman Empire. Now we know the Romans were brilliant people because of the Roman roads, because of the aqueduct system, but did you know that they were a very literate society? They had bookstores, they had bookshops. They were very ferocious readers. And when uh, Rome was sacked by the barbarians in 410, it wiped out a very literate society and all the written documents that went along with it. So what happened after that? Middle Ages, we call it the Dark Ages. Do you know what happened in the Middle Ages? Absolutely nothing with regard to technological and printing advancement. Now I've been to Europe numerous times and I've seen some wonderful buildings, some castles, and things that were built in that time period. But besides that and some holy wars, there really was not a lot that carried the printed word forward. But if you know the story about the Benedict, Benedictine monks that worked in the scriptoriums, they carried the printed word by simply copying, copying Bibles. Fast forward, as Dr. Onwar said, to the 1400s, and this is where printing as we know it today really began. A man by the name of Johann Gutenberg uh, from Germany invents movable type and the printing press in about 1455. Uh, his invention was so significant. You know, the Emerald Globe News has a man of the year every year, or uh, magazines have the man of the decade, whatever. Gutenberg was the man of the millennium. Can you imagine that? His invention, the printing press, 
was the most significant uh, uh, technological advancement in the last 1,000 years, man of the millennium. So what did he do with this great invention, the printing press? Well, the monks had spent hours hand lettering Bibles. And it said that it would take about 10 years for a monk to hand letter one Bible, 10 years. So Gutenberg sets out, he's going to print 300 Bibles in three years. Now, like a lot of printers, Gutenberg didn't have any money. So he goes to a man named Jonathan First, F-U-R-S-T, who is a German financier. He loans Gutenberg the money to buy the paper to get his business going. And again, the assignments to print 300 Bibles. He was such a perfectionist, he never printed 300 Bibles. He printed 180. Uh, 135 of those were on paper. 45 were on either calfskin or vellum. And uh, there's only about 49 of those that exist today. Uh, I have seen three of them. One on loan uh, at the University of Texas. I saw two of them at the uh, Gutenberg Museum in Mainz, Germany. So if you're rummaging through your grandmother's attic and you come across a Gutenberg Bible, I can promise you they're gonna be worth more than your old baseball cards. Gutenberg, however, died blind and he died broke uh, in, uh, in 1468. Now, whenever I've taught classes in entrepreneurship, I, I try to use this as a, as a teaching moment because here is an example of a person that had a terrific idea. He was the man of the millennium. He didn't know that at the time, but he had this great idea, but he dies blind and broke. Why? Well, he'd never heard of a marketing plan, never heard of a business plan, probably never wrote a pro forma. Look at all the businesses today that start out with a good idea, whether it's an auto body shop or a bakery, but they don't have the time management skills or the managerial or finance skills to succeed. And so Gutenberg dies blind and broke. Just as a footnote, the largest Bible printer today is uh, uh, Amity Printing in, in, in China. Uh, so fast forward, although Gutenberg dies, the printing press lived on. Printers soon became very dangerous people. If you had a printing press, you could print pamphlets and things that were sometimes true, sometimes not. Consider this, there, were no, uh, there was no Federal Communications Commission back then. There were no uh, uh, attorneys that would uh, sue you for, uh, for libel. So there were a lot of printed word got out that were oftentimes half-truths. And those in power, whether it was church or government, also, I mean, oftentimes persecuted and oftentimes uh, criticized and, and killed people that were... Uh, putting out documents that were uh, against the way they felt. Fast forward to the Protestant Reformation. You've all heard of this in history classes. Uh, Catholic Church was the primary religion in uh, Europe at the time. And uh, uh, Martin Luther, who started the Lutheran or church, uh, was kind of fed up with some of the things the Catholic Church were, were doing. So he writes his 95 theses called the Disputation of the Power of Indulgences. Now, what indulgences are is another story, and I won't bore you with that this morning. But he writes the nine, his 95 theses, prints copies, and nails a copy to the church in Wickenburg, Germany. And, of course, other activities ensued, but that was one of the things. The printing press was one of the things that really took... Uh, religion to the next level, if you will. And hence we had John Wesley and the Methodist organization and other uh, organizations started in, the, uh, in that period of time. And the thing that drove it was the printing press. Now, keep in mind when uh, Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the door in Wickenburg, that was 1517. Now, fast forward for a minute to the age of discovery. Y'all remember in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Everybody remembers that. Well, he was sailing for Queen Isabella and Ferdinand from Spain to find the new world. So he sort of found it and a land that was ultimately called America. Well, people were enamored with travel, just like we are today. My wife and I are, are planning a vacation. What's the first thing we do? 
We send off for maps and brochures and literature, much the same way that people did back in those days because they're curious about travel to the new world. What I have here, follow along with me if you will, this was a, uh, uh, you know, Angela Merkel, who was a uh, minister of, of, of Germany, recently uh, gave this to the uh, Library of Congress, but it says, she officially handed over to the United States a 500-year-old map that was the first to tell the world about a new land called America. And on this map is the first written document where the word America is actually used. And that was 1507. Martin Luther nails his 95 theses in 1517. This map was printed in 1507. So you can see how the world is starting to change back in those days from a religious standpoint, also from a travel standpoint, and uh, other standpoints as well. Well, like the barbarians that sacked Rome, the Spanish did the same thing with the Incas, the Mayans, uh, and a lot of the uh, Central and South American countries, but yet the printing press finds its way to the New World. Jamestown started in 1608. America's developing. We're going to have the 13 colonies. Uh, printing press finds its way, makes its way into the New World. And everybody's heard of Benjamin Franklin because he was a great inventor. But Benjamin Franklin was also one of the most famous printers that ever lived. He printed the uh, on the Philadelphia Gazette, and he also published uh, Poor Richard's Almanac. Poor Richard's Almanac was... Uh, a store, uh, a book that he came out with regularly that included anecdotes and stories and editorials and things of interest. And by the way, uh, Benjamin Franklin was poor Richard. Fast forward to the 1800s, late 1800s, another German by the name of Otmar Megenthaler develops a machine called the linotype. Now, heretofore, most type that was used in printing was handset, a letter at a time, just the way Gutenberg did it. The line of type was a cast in metal, and it printed one line at a time that you would ink and then press onto paper, and that was called letter press printing. That was an advancement, but not a tremendous advancement from the days of, uh, of Gutenberg. After World War II in this country, offset lithography, which is what we do today, in addition to digital, is kind of the de facto standard for most uh, magazines and publications. And then also you have gravure, photo gravure, and uh, flexographic, flexographic printing. Today, there are about 31,500 printing companies in the United States. Uh, there's been a lot of merger and acquisition because a lot of mom and pop printers could not make the jump from analog to digital. They'd saved up their money, they're about to retire, so is it spend half a million dollars on digital equipment or buy that Airstream trailer and go to the Grand Tetons. And most people decided, yeah, I've worked my whole life, I'm gonna sell out. And so a lot of people sold, closed their businesses, or merged or were purchased by other companies like we were. Today, the printing industry is about an $85 billion annual revenue. If you add trucking and paper and graphic design, things such as that, it's probably larger, but that's the published uh, uh, figure. Largest printer in the United States is R.R. R. Donnelly in Chicago. Second is a company called uh, Quad Graphics in Minnesota. Uh, Transcontinental is uh, uh, out of Montreal, large Canadian printer. And then here we are, Sinveo and our subsidiary, Color Art at about a billion, about a billion one. Worldwide, let's look at the impact of the printing industry from a worldwide standpoint. Globally, it's about $412 billion. So what we're doing in the U.S. is maybe barely 20% of that. So a lot of printing rest of the world. The Wall Street Group out of the U.K. is at about 4.8 euro, which is about 5.1 billion. Dr. Anwar mentioned Nippon printing in China and Quinn in uh, Japan and Quinn in, uh, in China. I didn't have sales figures for them, but they're multi-billion dollar uh, worldwide printing companies. Projected growth in the printing industry uh, in the next five years is going to be about 2.25% annually. Now, it's not a big number, as you might guess, but it's a steady growth. We've 
come back from a, a period where there's been way too much capacity in the industry and you can print for less money digitally than you could with traditional offsets. So this is no small deal and the profitability on that two and a quarter uh, percent growth is uh, pretty substantial. Areas that you're gonna see grow uh, more than others, you're gonna see more printed material come out of uh, Africa, the Middle East, even uh, Bangladesh, places such as that. Growing consumers for print are primarily gonna be uh, some of the Asia Pacific countries, China, Vietnam, India, Philippines, uh, et cetera, and that's no uh, surprise to anyone. Uh, these are some things you're never probably gonna see again. These are, these are products that are going out of, are, going, are never gonna be printed. Encyclopedias, how many people own a set of encyclopedias? I got a set in 1948, it took four people to carry them in the door. They were obsolete within about five years. When my parents passed away, I don't know what to do with them. I think I made a boat anchor out of them. But you don't see encyclopedias. When I was at WT, we learned to go to the library to use the Vernon Black statute law books. No such thing anymore. The only reason that you'd have uh, Vernon Black statutes is lawyers have their picture made in front of them. But everything else is on, uh, is online. Business forms, snap out, carbon release forms, counter tickets, things that we used to use in retail business are gone. Uh, some publications, even textbooks, and some catalogs. Now these are the things that are gonna flourish. These are the things that are gonna even grow. Advertising printing, direct mail is gonna to continue to be a big industry. High quality publications, I'm talking about Texas Monthly, Cowboys and Indians Magazine, Polo Magazine, things such as that. National Geographic, lithographs, art reproductions, catalogs and e-catalogs, companies that are successful and come to mind are Orvis, Land's End, companies such as that, have an e-catalog and a printed catalog that they're sending out direct mail. And then I skipped over labels and packaging because that's such a big, big industry. Said in China that 50% of the growth coming out of China in the next five years is gonna be in packaging. We had a plant in Honduras that we ended up selling, but it was very profitable and they ran uh, seven days a week on packaging. Just go in a grocery store, look around. All the labels on all the products, all the cartons, and carton printing also is a big part of the, of the printing business. Here's some things that'll hold their own. They probably won't grow much, they may shrink. Newspapers, telephone books. How many people have a telephone book? That was our third biggest industry 20 years ago. We did well over $2 million a year printing telephone book covers for companies all over the United States. And corporate reports. The SEC used to require that any shareholder receive an annual report, no longer a requirement. Nowadays, you get a card in the mail driving you to a website where you can get corporate information, so you're not gonna see much of that anymore. Digital technology has made a tremendous difference uh, in printing and especially in, in publishing. Imagine what the world was like before email and before uh, file transfer protocol or FTP sites. Uh, how many people know how to cut and paste on your computer? Probably everybody here. Well, 30 years ago, that's what we did. We cut and paste. We post, pasted the back of a sheet of paper, we cut it apart, we pasted it up, and we shot film. So that's where the term cut and paste came from because that was literally what we had to do to make a document. And today, one of the most exciting things, I mentioned uh, load sharing, but also remote preparation and proofing. Let me give you an example of this. One of the companies that Sinveo had uh, was a major comic book company. Uh, our sales team on that handled that out of Atlanta. But a lot of the work was done uh, in Mumbai, one of the plants in, uh, in India. So what would happen is we would create the storyboard here in Amarillo, send it electronically overseas. The, the uh, skilled folks in India would do the illustrations, add photos, prepare the, the uh, proofs, send the proofs back to the United States or whoever was gonna do the proofreading. Then they would do the final edits 
package the document, send it back to our facility in Atlanta where the paper was ordered, scheduling was done, and then that was forwarded to Richmond, Virginia where the jobs were printed and shipped from there. Now, how many different places in the world did this touch? Several, but this was all totally seamless to the client. Now, this is something that obviously could not have been done before 20 years or so. And a lot of this was available because of the Macintosh by Apple and then the open architecture uh, computers that came along like IBM and Windows and all those things that, that made that possible. Uh, Mac and Apple are probably still the go-to uh, platforms for graphic designers. Now, let me very quickly run you through the most significant time periods in the history of man. This is my opinion, but just bear with me for a minute. How about this, the Renaissance. What happened before the Renaissance? Absolutely nothing. It was the Dark Ages, right? All of a sudden in the Renaissance, Leonardo da Vinci paints the Mona Lisa, The Last Supper. Michelangelo does the Sistine Chapel. Sir Isaac Newton does gravity in the telescope. Look at all the things that happened during that time period. That is called the rebirth of learning and the printing press. The printing press helped drive a lot of that uh, a lot of that to let the world know what was going on. The next period, the Industrial Revolution. Everybody knows about that. Started in the UK, Great Britain, about 1740. And for the first time in history, we had factories and power-driven equipment. And look at all the inventions. They're too numerous to mention, but Eli Whitney, James Watt, James Hargreaves, locomotives. All these things were developed during the Industrial Revolution. Printing press played a big, big part in that growth. Well, uh, very quickly that spread to America and uh, the Industrial Revolution continued here. The third significant time period is right now. We are all in it. Now, is that exciting? We couldn't experience the Renaissance or Industrial Revolution, but we can all experience the information age because that's where we are today. Uh, again, the advancements are, are way too numerous, but uh, computerization. The guy that was president of IBM back in 1943 was uh, Thomas Watson, and he said, you know, there might be a place for five, maybe six computers in the world. He was thinking about the big mainframes, the Univacs. Uh, Ken Olson, who started Digital Equipment Corporation in 1977, said, I can see no reason for anyone to have a home computer. Little did he know. Look at some of these other advancements, uh, military advancements, science, cloning, nuclear medicine. What would the world have been like last year if we couldn't have Zoom meetings? What would that have been like? Or WebEx. Uh, in the printing industry, we used to do paste-up boards and shoot film. Nowadays, we build entire jobs on the computer and go directly to plate. So computer to plate's a big deal. Satellite transmission. I'm going to talk more about printing on demand, variable data, and augmented reality, but you can see some of the advancements that have happened in, in your lifetime, but certainly not until uh, about the 1980s or so. Now, let's talk about this from a marketing standpoint. Even after World War I, if you had a product and you wanted to market it, the go-to method was mass marketing, right? run an ad in the newspaper or magazine, uh, something along those lines, or do a massive direct mail campaign, or put an ad in Time Magazine, Life Magazine, something along those lines. No individualism, no market segmentation to it at all. Now, when I get down to West Texas in the 1960s, 1970s, all we're talking about in marketing is market segmentation. Uh, you started to see like, for example, Sears and Roebuck, they printed their catalog from 1888 until 1993 or so. It's about yay thick. And I would get one at the house when I was a kid and I would order a baseball glove. Two years later, I'd order a bat, maybe a ball. Well, but they're sending me this whole thick catalog. So they realized, here's this farmer who ordered a rake and a year later he ordered a hoe, but yet we're all getting these big catalogs. So they started to segment sporting goods, farm equipment, ladies ready to wear, whatever it was, 
and they would mail those to the people that had been ordering products such as that. Direct mail. We started mailing by zip codes rather than the whole city. Well, nowadays, you may not want to mail the whole city of Canyon, which is 79015, but because you have some big houses and some lesser houses and some dormitories and whatnot, so you can segment that to not just zip code, but carrier route. And uh, you can mail uh, by income level. You may, I used to do mailings for a uh, uh, lakefront property, and we mailed uh, mail-headed households, $75,000 income, select carrier routes in certain uh, zip codes in certain parts of the country. So we could narrow that down, and a lot of that was based on data we got from the, from the census. Today, we have one-on-one uh, -on -one marketing, and that's kind of the trend as to where we're, where we're headed. And let me just give you an idea about that. We had a company in uh, Nashville, and they were working for one of the big box stores. It wasn't uh, Lowe's or, or uh, uh, Home Depot, one of those. But a person would go in, and they'd be looking at lumber because they're going to build a deck, okay? So the salesperson gets all this information, he walks out, uh, so the buyer walks out. Within a week, he gets a beautifully printed, digitally printed postcard, and it has a pearl, personalized URL, driving you to that website. When you open up your pearl, what do you see? You see that deck that you've been looking at exactly to the specifications that you gave the salesperson, and on that deck, you might see some patio furniture or something like that. And so each week you're going to get a pearl or you're going to get an email and uh, it's going to have something that has to do with that deck, whether it's stain, whether it's a barbecue pit, something seasonal. But again, it was the direct mail piece that drove you to the website. Uh, variable data is another thing that we're seeing uh, a lot. Used to, uh, I have a customer, had a customer that uh, a large organization had 300,000 members and you had to renew your membership each year for a fee. So every year they would mail out a letter. Dear member, please renew your membership. Nothing personal about it. But with variable data, now we can print a letter that says, Dear Dr. Anwar, and this happened to be an equine industry, but it would name his horse and how many points the horse had and when the last show they went to. And the more personal data you include in a letter, then the higher the response rate. Uh, Augmented reality, I think everybody's probably heard of augmented reality. It's also known as uh, 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 mixed reality or computer-mediated reality. And I want to tell you just a second how it kind of works in our industry, but it's a method to incorporate motion and sound into a linear object. So if you build the image right with the proper software, uh, and used to you had to have an app on your phone. Nowadays, most of the new, new phones have that. You can hover over an image, and if it's built with, uh, with AR and the right software, then it'll have sound and motion. Uh, Diana Nyad swam the English Channel. She was on the cover of People magazine. I hovered over it with my phone. She started to swim. The water could splash. You could hear it. And so I was so taken with the technology. We did an annual report for a company out of New Mexico, and... Uh, the CEO was at his desk, and if you hovered over with your phone, he looks up, and for eight seconds, he tells you something exciting that's going on with their company. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, interest in it. Matter of fact, the United States Post Office, who has had financial struggles forever, uh, is so sure that this technology is going to catch on. One time, they were giving postal discounts. Uh, just very quickly, and I won't dwell on, on these, but... You know, books should never go out of print again. In the past, there was so much preparation in making plates to print a book that you had to make a long press run to uh, amortize the fixed cost to get down to a price point that it was competitive. And a lot of times that meant printing far more books than what you really needed. Well, you tied up too much money, books went obsolete, and there were also uh, storage issues, logistics issues. With digital printing, if you want 100 books, print 100 books. If you want 500 books, print 500 books. 
If you need 10,000 books, go to, uh, back to the offset printing method. But there never should be a book go out of print again uh, because of that. I'd be remiss if I didn't take two minutes and uh, touch on some misconceptions about, about print. Number one, people say, paper kills trees. If you remember Earth Day in 1970, there were 20% more trees in the U.S. today than there were then. And millions of trees are being planted, planted daily and annually, and three to four more times trees are being planted that are being harvested. This all comes from the National Forestry Service. And printing only takes about 11% of that is used for paper. Another myth, electronic communications is more environmentally friendly. Not true. CO2 emissions from DVD manufacturing are four times higher than printing a 100-page magazine. Another myth, printing is not green. 25 years ago, there was very little recycling that went on in the printing industry. Today, 65% of all the paper that's picked up has a recycled com content to it. We're members of the sustainable forest industry. We're certified. It costs us every year. We take in 1,000 pounds of paper. We print on it, ship out 850 pounds. We have to count that other 150 pounds. We bale it, ship it back to be de-inked, and to go back into the manufacturing stream. Another myth, direct mail is no longer an important marketing tool. 45% of recipients sort and read their mail every day, and 40% say that they have visited a new business because of direct mail. 59% people have explored new products simply because of something that they got in the mail. Uh, a lot of small businesses use a combination of direct mail and uh, email, which is for probably budget-driven as much as anything. And then finally, uh, uh, myth. Print does not produce results. Well, I can tell you this information comes from the Direct Marketing Association. For every dollar spent on printing, it returns $7 return on investment. 63% of people bought something from a custom publication. And this is the thing I want to emphasize. 79% of nonprofit solicitation comes from direct mail because there's such a click-through, uh, low click-through rate on email. I'm on the board of three nonprofits and we're dependent on direct mail and donations. And we get virtually little or nothing from online and a nice printed piece in the right person's hands uh, generates results. Now remember, I'm two minutes away from the conclusion here. Remember all the advancements we talked about earlier, too numerous to mention, cloning, GPS, etc., to name a few. What in the world is next? Do you have any idea? What's next? I don't know. But here's a final thought. How many people, people have seen the South Pacific or Oklahoma, the King and I, are familiar with Richard Rogers and Oscar Hammerstein? Probably the one of the most prolific uh, screenplay songwriters in the history of man. In 1943, they wrote a play called Oklahoma. Anybody see it? I know Emma Little Theater's done it. W.T. Brandy and Iron may have done it. Uh, it takes place in 1904 in what was then the Oklahoma Territory. Oklahoma didn't become a state until 1906. So this takes place in the Oklahoma Territory. It's a love story between a young man and a young woman living in rural Oklahoma. And the young man makes a trip to, Oklahoma, to uh, Kansas City on business. And there's a song in that play called Everything's Up to Date in Kansas City. So what does he see when he goes there? He sees uh, gas buggies, automobiles. He hears a voice through a, through a wire, bell telephone. He, sees, he feels radiator heat. He sees a magic lantern show, which was forerunner of cinema. And he sees a skyscraper seven stories tall. You know, now, what in uh, uh, Middle East, there's a 160 or 70 story building, and one being built in Kuala Lumpur right now in Malaysia. It's going to be 120, 30 stories tall, however. 
Can you imagine how he felt in 1904? We've, we've seen it all. In the course of that song, and pardon me for this because I'm going to sing it, he says, we've gone about as far as we can go. Pardon me, I warned you. We've gone as far as we can go. That's it. Seven stories tall. Are you kidding me? Uh, have we gone as far as we can go? Possibly, possibly not, but I can assure you that whatever the future holds, print is going to be a big part of it. And then finally, I want to share the printer's favorite Bible verse for you Bible scholars. It comes from Ecclesiastes 12, 12. And therefore, my son, take note, because the making of books, there is no end. And I had bet my whole 50 years on that Bible verse. So thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. You talked about the information age, the Industrial Revolution, and the Renaissance. You said towards the end that you didn't know what was next, but what sort of age do you think is coming next? Wow. I like to watch the stock market, and if I could, if I could answer that, if I'd have bought Apple stock 30 years ago, probably wouldn't be standing here right this minute. But I'll, I will tell you this. I know that there are some things that are being experimented with. Uh, one thing is erasable paper, uh, paper that you can run through a device at home and it prints your newspaper or your communication and it can be erased and reused. Another thing is uh, uh, lenticular printing which is flat surface 3D, like you would wear uh, 3D glasses. But they're trying to develop a technique there to where it doesn't take 3D glasses to, to, to do that. The 3D printing that we hear about a lot is not really something that printers do. It's where you're printing an object, and that's done with a uh, plastic resin and UV light where you're actually printing an actual object in layers. Uh, that's a different kind of 3D than, than what commercial printers do. But, uh, you know, when you think about Apple Watches and the latest and greatest smartphones and all that, it's pretty mind-boggling. I've got a uh, four-year-old granddaughter, and all this is so common to her. Uh, she was staying at the house with us the other night, and it was time for dinner, and my wife said, Tony, turn off the TV where we can eat. And uh, I had the TV, you know, I had the, a movie on, and I wasn't exactly sure how to cut it all off. And she was three and a half then, and so she said, uh, she calls me Silver. Silver, hit that red button right there. So, you know, young people are so much further advanced. That's a great question. I appreciate your answer. I wish I had a better answer, but others. Yes, sir. Uh, what was the hardest thing from going from analog to digital? Money uh, was a big part of it. I know I, uh, the first thing we did was we bought a, a uh, digital laser film setter. And we bought, uh, our server was an SEC 30, which wouldn't even be a good boat anchor now. And our devices were uh, Mac Quadras. And y'all have probably never even heard of those because they're long, long since gone. They're about yay big. And when we made our first purchases in the digital arena, we spent about $300,000. And I remember thinking to myself, well, thank goodness we've finally done that. We won't have to do that again. And then a fellow that was helping us with some training, a guy named Mark Orshant out of Albuquerque, he said, Tony, you're going to spend that much in training alone in the next five years. And so, in fact, we did. Every time we bought a new piece of equipment, you had to go to Boston to learn how to operate it. You had to go to Dallas. You had to go to Palo Alto. So, two things. Money was probably the, 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 the big thing. And then secondly, printing over the years had become an industry where if you wanted to get involved in printing, you became a printer's helper, known as a printer's devil, kind of like helping an elect, kind of an apprenticeship, and you worked your way up. Well, young people don't want to do that. 
But once we moved into the digital age, we've been able to attract the smartest and, and brightest people. And uh, I always say this tongue in cheek, but I say it with a lot of pride. You can't believe the nerds we have working for us. The guys that are understand all the software, all the hardware. And, and this was something that was very difficult to attract several years ago. So thank you for that. Yes, sir. Um, as someone who has uh, found success in, an, on, in entrepreneurial endeavors, uh, what kind of advice would you give to someone who's looking for that kind of career path in an increasingly um, competitive environment? So I'm not sure I understood the question totally. Uh, question was, what advice would I give someone that was graduating and pursuing a career? Uh, in, in, like, uh, in an entrepreneurial avenue, just starting a business and stuff. As an entrepreneur? Yeah. Uh, another great question. I know in my case, if I had graduated from college and started my own business, I don't know how successful I would have been. But I had uh, a couple of mentors. One, I know Dr. Anwar knows, Bill Simmelbeck, who was a prof uh, professor here for many years. He's 92 years old, lives in Midland. I still call him periodically because I value his opinions and value his friendship. But I had a lot of people on my side. And when I got in business, uh, I had someone to help teach me the business, and I don't think I could have learned that by myself. So it probably depends on the industry. If you're thinking about going into graphic design or computer science, something like that, you probably already have the already have the tools to be a successful entrepreneur from that standpoint, technically. But again, it takes more like Gutenberg. It takes more than a great idea. So I know when I was in graduate school, as a marketing major, I didn't really have as much accounting or finance as I wished I had of later. And so in graduate school, I had more accounting and I had more finance. And uh, those things were very important to me when I started borrowing money, looking at rate of return, looking at net present value, all the things that you learn in finance classes. How many people have had enough finance? Everybody had finance? Well, uh, a lot of it kind of goes in one ear, and out, one ear and out the other, but when you really start using it, you'll realize just how important it is. Good question, and thank you for that. Yes, sir. With COVID, it, uh, it reduced. There wasn't as much printing during COVID in, in, in some areas, but in other areas, it, it, it grew because of direct mail and, and, uh, and magazines. Because we had a captive audience. People were home. They weren't out listening to their car radio. They obviously were watching TV and Netflix and things like that, but when people are home, you have a captive audience. And so that end of the industry really, really grew. The other thing that was a real aid, uh, as I mentioned, WebEx and Zoom. Uh, I'm on several boards and almost every meeting that we had was a Zoom meeting. I'm on the chamber board, the convention district council, we run a baseball league, and a number of things. But if we couldn't have Zoomed, we probably couldn't have operated. And then business-wise, we used WebEx because it's a little bit more robust and a little bit, uh, a little bit uh, safer. But those were two, two big things. So, other questions? Tony, uh, let me ask you one question. So, down the road, five, six, ten years, what do you see happening in the digital printing industry? You know, every year we see new technologies coming out. Any comments on that? Yes. Uh, I didn't cover this during the, uh, the talk, but there's basically two kinds of printing. 
You either run sheets or you run rolls. If you're familiar with the newspaper, they run rolls of paper, whereas most printers are running sheets of paper, flat sheets. So the rolls are called web offset. Sheets are called, are called a flat sheet or sheet-fed printing. They are just beginning to have some digital web or digital rotary presses. And we have one at a, we have a very modern plant in Eureka, uh, Missouri, about 30 miles outside of St. Louis. And they have a fleet, they have three of these presses that can run paper, digital format, different messages from one to the next, different pictures. So I know you teach customer relationship marketing, CRM, and one-on-one, -on -one, printing is gonna become a much more one-on-one uh, -on -one industry. You're not gonna see uh, market segmentation and mass merchandising near like you did uh, years ago. The key to that is mining your mailing list. If you had a fire in your plant, the one thing I did was I saved our hard drives and our mailing list because those were some of the most important things that you have. Look at it this way. If you can't collect the data, you can't mine the list. And so that's going to become, uh, I think, really the wave of the future uh, with digital printing. So we may be out of time, but I've, we've got maybe time for one more question. Didn't hear much from the ladies. Okay, thank you all very much. I appreciate it. Before you are Before we conclude, uh, Tony, on behalf of WT, we would like to give you a small token of our appreciation. Oh, wow. And these are all from WT, and uh, you will enjoy uh, using these. On yes. Your, uh, should, I, should I open it? Yes, yes, absolutely. Well, great. Oh, man. Now, that's high dollar. Thank you all so very much. That, uh, what can I say? On, on, buffaloes. And there's a pen also. It has your name. <laughs> oh, great. Well, thank you all so, so very much. Oh, and a terrific pen. Wow. Oh, wow, great. Well, and I will, I will leave you with one additional thought. Uh, although I've retired, I still have an office downtown. And uh, if anyone would like to... Uh, take a tour of our facility and see how printing really works in the real world, just ask Dr. Anwar. He's got my phone number. I'd be glad to meet you downtown. I still have a key to the front door, same one they gave me in 1970, and we can go in and uh, look at the shop, and uh, I can tell you more. So, Thank you. You bet. Have a seat. Well, before we conclude, I uh, just want to make a few comments. A uh, lot of insightful comments thought-provoking ideas. You covered a wonderful history, and a uh, lot of issues were discussed. But uh, one comment I would like to make, there are many seven-story buildings we'll be looking at in future. It means a lot of new technologies will be coming out. It's not over yet. I teach marketing strategy, international business, global strategy, all over the world. And uh, Asia Pacific is a very big market, as you correctly mentioned. But uh, data is very important, you correctly mentioned. But when you combine with data science, it becomes data science. Data saves lives. And what we saw in the COVID, all these issues. We have come a long way. When I started in WT 34 years ago, we did have Sears Roebuck in Amarillo. And some of you may have seen it, uh, but uh, some of the stores will be occupied by Amazon now. Uh, we have discussed it in our classes. But uh, we have a uh, lot of things we'll be witnessing, and this is what marketing is. It's not over yet, and uh, technologies are changing very fast. Uh, companies know each and everything about you, what you do, your consumption. So the final thought I have, two things apply here and that is consumption and growth. United States is the largest economy in the world because of consumption and growth, but uh, don't uh, <clears throat> just get relaxed. Other countries are catching up. 
And so the global competition is very, very tough. Uh, it doesn't matter which industry you are in. But overall, uh, Tony, uh, we appreciate all the comments. And uh, again, uh, let's give a good hand to our uh, distinguished speaker. Thank you again, and uh, we'll see you next time. Goodbye.